Good afternoon, madam. Well, where is it? I beg pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, madam. I didn't recognise you at first with the sun in my eyes. What can I do for you? I asked you where it is. What's happened to it? Oh, dear me. Do you mean to say it hasn't arrived? <laughs> if it had, I wouldn't be asking about it, would I? I'm very sorry about that, madam. It should have been there by now. It's disgraceful, that's what it is. You were particularly asked to get it there on time. So why is it so late? Well, you see, the construction took a little longer than usual, being rather out of the ordinary as it was. Just a minute. You've got another customer. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. I wonder, do you have a street map? I seem to have lost my way. I'm afraid I can't help you. This is an undertaker's and funeral establishment. Not a stationer's. I suggest you try elsewhere. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Really, some people. Now, let's see. What was I saying? You were starting to explain about that coffin. The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle Dramatised for radio by Peter Ling With Clive Madison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson and featuring Jack Claff as the Honourable Philip Green The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax May I ask, Holmes, what you were staring at so intently? Oh, your boots, old chap. Hmm? Most interesting. Yes, I must admit, my curiosity is aroused. I hope you won't think it impertinent of me to inquire. Why Turkish? They're not Turkish. They're English. I got them at Latimer's in Oxford. Uh, no, I was referring to the baths. Why did you go to an expensive Turkish bath when you could relax in the homegrown variety for nothing? A touch of rheumatism, if you must know. A Turkish bath is what we medical men call an alterative. A fresh start. Oh. A healthy change for the system. Mm, well, I'm sure it did you good. Yeah, but I still don't see the connection between my boots and the Turkish bath. It may be obvious to you, but I'd appreciate an explanation. Certainly, Watson. Well, it falls into the same category as asking... Uh... Uh, well, I was asking who shared a cab with you this morning. Now you're doing it again. Hmm? That's an example, not an explanation. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're quite right. <clears throat> right, let's take the second example first. The cab. You have splashes of mud on your left sleeve and shoulder. If you were in the centre of a hansom, you wouldn't have been splashed unilaterally. Therefore, you sat at the left-hand side, which proves that you had a companion. I happen to be seeing my cousin Agatha off to Taunton. We took a cab. Paddington State. My dear fellow, there's no need to account for your actions. I hope you don't think I was being inquisitive. Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, what about the boots and the bath? Well, you call it commonplace, Sophia. You're in the habit of lacing your boots in a certain way. This evening they're fastened with an elaborate double bow. Not your usual method. Someone else therefore tied them. Could it be a bootmaker? Hardly. They're not a new pair. So we're left with a, an attendant at the Turkish bath. Absurdly simple, isn't it? Very. Nevertheless, the bath undoubtedly served its purpose. What purpose? Well, you say you, you needed a change. I agree. I suggest you try another change of scene. How do you feel about taking a trip to Lausanne? Switzerland? Yes. Yeah. I thought you'd jump at the chance. I was just... Uh, I don't have very happy memories of Switzerland. Hmm? Oh, oh, oh well... That's all in the past, my dear fellow. You'll travel first class with all expenses paid, naturally. You'll be doing me a great service. Well, in that case, I'd be delighted. Yeah. What's it all about? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard of Lady Frances Carfax? Carfax? Carfax. No, I can't say I have. Who is she? Uh, she's one of the most dangerous of all classes. An innocent abroad, drifting and friendless woman. She has sufficient means to take her from country to country and from hotel to hotel. As often as not, she's lost in a maze of obscure pensions and boarding houses, a stray chicken in a world of foxes. If she's gobbled up, she would scarcely be missed. You think she may have been gobbled up? I very much fear some evil has befallen Lady Frances Carfax. Mm. 
Do you know any more about this unfortunate lady, her, her family, her background? She's the sole survivor of the late Earl of Rufton's family. She was left with limited means, but inherited some remarkable old Spanish jewellery of silver and curiously cut diamonds to which she was very attached. Perhaps rather too much so, for she refused to deposit them in the bank, but took them with her on her travels. Even in middle age, she was still a beautiful woman. Mm, you say she was? You think she may no longer be alive? Well, who can tell? Uh, there's our problem. Is she alive or dead? She is, or, or was, a lady of precise habits, and it's been her invariable custom to write a long letter every other week to her old governess, Miss Dobney, long since retired and now living in Camberwell. I suppose it's Miss Dobney who has consulted you. Mm, it is. <clears throat> she received the last letter from Lady Frances, written from the Hotel National in Lausanne. I made some inquiries. It seems that Lady Frances left there nearly five weeks ago. Is Miss Dobney the only source of information? Presumably she must have had other correspondents. Well, there was one correspondent I felt sure I could rely on, and that was her bank. Single ladies must live. In effect, their passbooks are their diaries. She banks at Sylvester's, and I've glanced over her account. The last cheque but one paid her bill at Lausanne. But it was for a large amount, and probably left her with cash in hand. Only one other cheque has been drawn since then. Oh? Uh -huh. To whom? To Mademoiselle Marie Devine. It was only to show where the cheque was written, but it was cashed at the Credit Lyonnais in Montpellier, less than three weeks ago, for the sum of fifty pounds. And who is this Miss Marie Devine? Do you know? Mm, I made it my business to discover her identity. She was a personal maid to Lady Frances. Fifty pounds to her maid. Hmm. But why? Well, so far, that remains a mystery. Well, I've no doubt that your researches will soon clear the matter up. My researches? Yes, hence the health-giving change of air, the trip to Lausanne. I'm still engaged upon another investigation, remember? I, I can't possibly leave London while old Abraham is in such mortal terror. Besides, on general principles, it's best that I shouldn't leave the country at present. Scotland Yard feels lonely without me, <laughs> and it causes a, an unhealthy excitement among the criminal classes. So, you want me to go in your place? Would you mind? No, I don't mind. I dare say I'll find out what you want to know soon enough. Yes, I'm sure you will. <laughs> and if you should need my humble counsel at any time, it awaits you, day or night, on the end of the Continental Telegraph wire, at the extravagant rate of tuppence a word. Go then, my dear Watson, and bon voyage. Dr. Watson, huh? Ah, yes, room 313. I hope you will enjoy your stay. Thank you. I am... Um, La valise 313, huh? The boy will show you to your rooms. Yeah, I'll go up presently, Monsieur Moser. First, I should like to ask you one or two questions about a certain lady who stayed at this hotel recently. Ah, you do not surprise me. When I receive a telegram from the celebrated Sherlock Holmes making the reservation on your behalf, I say to myself, Tiens, this is no doubt in connection with some international crime. <laughs> May we hope that the great Sherlock Holmes himself will be joining here shortly. No, I am acting on his behalf. Mr. Holmes is otherwise engaged, unfortunately. Ah, yes, it is very unfortunate. Perhaps some other time he uh, may... Perhaps. This is hardly a criminal investigation, Monsieur Bozo. I'm here to try and trace the whereabouts of a missing person. This hotel is the latest address that we have for her, so... Uh, one moment, Doctor. Perhaps you would care to enter my private office. We shall not be disturbed there. Ah. Uh, this way, if you please. Asseyez-vous, uh, s'il Thank you. Now, Dr. Watson, may I assume your inquiry is about Lady Frances Carfax? Yes, it is. Once again, I have to say that you do not surprise me. When the lady left us so suddenly and unexpectedly, I must confess I thought it was very strange. What was strange about it? She had appeared to be so happy here. 
She occupied the best suite of rooms in the hotel with a superb view across the lake, yet she left at one day's notice, and just after she had paid another week's rent in advance, too. Mm. Was she by nature a changeable person, a difficult guest, perhaps? Mm, not at all. Lady Frances is a charming person, very much liked by everyone here. No longer young, you understand, but mm. still handsome and elegant. And no doubt fashionably dressed. She possessed some remarkable jewellery, I believe. Oh, well, as to that, I uh, cannot say. She did not entrust any valuables to the hotel safe. But I remember a maid telling me that Lady Frances kept the trunk in her bedroom locked at all times. The maid? That would be Mademoiselle Marie de Vigne. What can you tell me about her? Oh, <laughs> she was as popular as her mistress. Quite delightful. A local girl? Oh, no, no, no. She came from Montpellier, I believe, in the Arrow. Ah, that explains it. So, when her ladyship and Mr. Veen left here, they were travelling to Montpellier, were they? Mm, mais non, Père tout. Why should you think so? Only because Mr. Veen cashed a cheque signed by Lady Frances at a bank in Montpellier. Oh, that is altogether extraordinary. When they left here, I am quite certain they did not travel to Montpellier. They left with great urgency and not a little secrecy also. Secrecy? How was that? You place me in a delicate situation, Dr. Watson. I was given strict instructions to tell this to nobody. But as it is the great Sherlock Holmes who wishes to find Lady Frances, I suppose I may trust you. I sincerely hope so. Please tell me everything you know. It may be of the utmost importance. Oh, very well. Lady Frances made it known that she was going to stay at an hotel in Baden, near Zurich, mm -hmm. and her luggage was labelled accordingly. But, in fact, the luggage was to be redirected when it reached there, because they were actually travelling to a different Baden, not in Switzerland at all, the German spa in the Rhineland. I don't understand. Why should she proceed in such a roundabout way? I must tell you, monsieur, I think there was a man involved. Good heavens. What man? Who was he? His name I cannot tell you, but he called in here the day before Lady Frances left. I spoke to him myself, a huge, powerful man with a black beard, and sauvage, and very trouble sauvage. I beg your pardon? Oh, excuse me. He looked like a wild man, a real savage. He would not give his name, but insisted he must see Lady Frances immediately. I telephoned her room, but when I described him, she refused absolutely to meet him. I had to tell him so, and he became violently enraged. For a moment I feared he would cause trouble, but at last he walked out, swearing to return. Lady Frances changed her plans at once and left Lausanne for Baden the following morning. I see. Tell me, do you happen to know the name of the hotel in Baden? No, but of course I made the reservation myself. It was the English Hof. Oh, was it? Oh, there is something wrong? No. I once stayed at another hotel of that name. Ah, uh, no matter. I'm very much obliged to you, Monsieur Moser. One further question. Where do I go to send a telegram? And therefore proceeding immediately to English Hof Hotel, Baden. Obviously, Lady Frances fleeing sinister stranger. But why proceed via Baden, Switzerland, when en route for Baden, Rhineland? Signed, J.W. I've had similar problem myself at Crew Junction. Nil desperandum. Continue sterling work. Signed, Essex. Lady Frances Carfax. Of course, Herr Doctor, I remember her very well. She stayed here for two weeks. I would describe her as a very lonely person. Lonely? What gave you that impression? Like many lonely ladies, Lady Frances found consolation in religion. While staying here, she made the acquaintance of a Dr. Schlesinger and his wife. They were missionaries newly returned from South America, and they soon became very good friends. I'm glad to hear it. Dr. Schlesinger has a remarkable personality, and the fact that he was recovering from malaria, contracted in the course of his duties, affected Lady Frances deeply. She helped Mrs. Schlesinger to nurse the man of God, and he made a very good recovery. 
When he was strong enough to travel, Lady Frances accompanied the Schlesingers to London uh, three weeks ago. To London? Extraordinary. What's extraordinary about it, Herr Doctor? That is her home, is it not? Yes. But if she is in London, she has not returned to her own house or made herself known to her friends. But what about the maid, Marie Devine? Did she go to London with the rest of the party? Oh, no. A few days earlier, she went away alone, crying many tears and telling the girls on my staff that she would never go into service again. She gave in her notice. As is that or she was dismissed, I can tell you no more than that. Ah. Well, thank you, Herr Brand. You have been very helpful. There is one other matter you may like to know. Hmm? Uh, you are not the only person who comes here to inquire after Lady Francis. Indeed? Uh, five days ago, another man came here on the same errand. Did he give his name? No, he did not. He was an Englishman, so not the usual type of Englishman abroad. Not a quiet, reserved gentleman. A savage, perhaps. A wild man. You have it, there, Doctor. That describes him perfectly. A bearded, sunburned fellow. Hard and fierce. I should not like to cross such a man. Uh, did the Schlesingers leave an address by any chance? Alas, no. The only one who gave an address on her departure was Mademoiselle Devine. Somewhere in Montpellier. Would that be of interest to you? Mystery defines itself. Lady Frances, pursued by sinister figure, bent on revenge. Has he already overtaken her? Perhaps Marie Devine holds answer to Riddle. Signed, J.W. Please send description, Dr. Schlesinger's left ear, soonest possible. Regards, signed, Essex. Your idea of humour, somewhat obscure and singularly ill-timed. I'm therefore proceeding immediately to 11 Rue de Trajan, Montpellier. Signed, J.W. Monsieur Desir. Un café au lait, s'il vous plaît. Uh, no, better make that de café. I'm expecting to meet a young lady. De café, monsieur. Et bon chance. I beg your pardon? C'est la carte postale. Très jolie. Voulez-vous des cartes postales? What did he say? He asks, do you wish to buy postcards? Très jolie. Très amusante. Certainly not. Go away. Allez-vous en. Oh. Forgive me. You are Dr. Watson? Mademoiselle Devine? Bonjour. I received your note. How may I help you? Won't you sit down? I took the liberty of ordering coffee. Oh, you're very kind. As I said in my letter, it's in connection with Lady Frances Carfax. Yes, but I do not know if there's much I can tell you. You parted from Lady Frances on rather bad terms, I believe. Oh, no, no, not at all. Lady Frances has always been kind to me. I only left her because she was returning to London and I had to come home. I am engaged to be married in a few weeks. Oh, my apologies, mademoiselle, and my good wishes. Merci, monsieur. <laughs> I heard you were in tears when you left Lady Frances, and I assumed... Oh, she gave me 50 pounds as a wedding present. It broke my heart to say goodbye. Ah. My only comfort was that I left her in good company. Dr. and Mrs. Schlesinger? Oh, you know them. Oh, I, I was relieved because of that wicked man who followed her everywhere. I knew she would be safe in the care of her new friends. Tell me about this man. Who was he? I only saw him the once. In the foyer of the hotel at Lausanne. Oh, he was a terrible man. She would never speak of him, but I know she lived in a state of continual terror. <gasps> oh, mon Dieu. What is it? What's the matter? He pursues her still. There he is now. The man coming towards us. Mademoiselle Devine. Yes, but... I inquired at your house. They said I would find you here. <laughs> Kindly stop annoying this young lady, sir. Who the devil are you? Never mind that. Where is Lady Frances Carfax? What? What have you done with her? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Take your head! Mind your head, Watson! How are you feeling now? What? Uh, no, no, no picture postcards. How many more? Uh, forget times? the postcards, old chap. How are you feeling? Good, good Lord! Holmes! But what? Uh, 
who he... I've kept an eye on you since you arrived in Montpellier. When our bearded friend got his hands around your windpipe, I thought it was time to intervene. So I struck him behind the ear with a water carafe, and he went down like a felled ox, taking you and the table with him. But uh, where is he now? Where's Mademoiselle Devine? Uh, she took to her heels, and I can't say I blame her. As for your opponent, I fancy we shall run into him again presently. Meanwhile, I suggest we return to your hotel and tidy you up. I'm glad to see you looking a little more like your old self, bathed, changed, and in your right mind at last. What do you mean by that? Well, my dear fellow, you must admit you made a pretty good hash of things so far, eh? Certainly not. What are you doing here, anyway? I thought you were fully occupied with the Abrahams case. Well, the moment that was cleared up, I left London by the night train, and not a moment too soon by the look of it. You needn't have troubled. I could have handled matters perfectly well without you. Well, you've been remarkably consistent, I grant you that. Thank you. In fact, I can't offhand recall any possible blunder which you've managed to avoid. Now, look the here. The total result of your efforts has been to raise the alarm everywhere and discover nothing. Perhaps you think you might have done better. Oh, well, there's no perhaps about it. I have done better. Ah, this will be the Honourable Philip Green. I trust that with his help we may find a fresh starting point to this whole sorry business. Come in. Mr. Holmes, I received your message and I have come to... Why is this man here? Allow me to present my old friend and trusted associate, Dr. Watson, who's assisting me in this curious case. Oh, for heaven's sake, shake hands, gentlemen. Well, I... Uh... How do you do? Dr. Watson, I hope I didn't do you any damage. The fact is, I've been living on my nerves lately, and when you accused me of harming Francis, I'm afraid I lost my head. Uh, this situation is completely beyond me. And beyond me, too. Or so I'm led to believe. No doubt Mr. Holmes will explain it to us. What I can't fathom out, Mr. Holmes, is how in the world you came to know of my existence. I've been in touch with Miss Dobney, the old governess of Lady Francis. Old Susan Dobney with the mob cap. I remember her very well. Yes, and she remembers you. It was in the days before before you found it necessary to go to South Africa. I see you already know the story. Well, I'll be frank with you, Mr. Holmes. No man in this world ever loved a woman more than I loved Francis. All right, uh, I was pretty wild as a youngster, I admit that. When she heard some of the things I'd done, well, she wouldn't have any more to do with me. <laughs> and yet she still loved me. Love me so much, she's remained single all her blessed days, just for my sake. As the years passed and I made some money and settled down, I, I thought... Perhaps it was foolish of me, but, but I thought... You thought you'd try to find her again? I traced her to Lausanne, and she ran away from me. I picked up her trail as far as Baden, but she gave me the slip again. Then I managed to track down her maid. For pity's sake, Mr. Holmes, tell me what has become of Lady Francis. That is what we intend to find out. How do you have a London address, Mr. Green? The Langham Hotel will find me. Mm, then may I recommend that you return there and stay on hand until I call you? Rest assured, I will do all I can for the safety of Lady Francis. I can say no more at present. Oh, here's my card, so you may keep in touch. And now, Watson, mm? perhaps you'll send a wire to Mrs. Hudson informing her that two hungry travellers will be arriving tomorrow night at eight. There's a telegram for you, Holmes. Mm, please open it for me, will you? Mm. <clears throat> it's from the English you at Baden. Ah. Just three words. Jagged or torn. What does it mean? It means everything. You may remember my seemingly irrelevant question regarding the clerical gentleman's left ear. Uh, I couldn't believe it was a serious inquiry. Well, luckily, I sent the same inquiry to the manager, Herr Brandt, and he produced the answer I expected. Dr. Schlesinger's left ear was jagged or torn. And what does that show? Well, it shows that we're dealing with an exceptionally astute and dangerous man. The Reverend Dr. Schlesinger, missionary from South America, is none other than Holy Peters, one of the most unscrupulous rascals Australia 
Lear has ever turned out. Yes, his speciality is the beguiling of lonely ladies by playing upon their religious sensibilities. But he has a wife. Mm. His so-called wife, an Englishwoman, is a worthy helpmeet. The nature of his tactic suggested Holy Peter's at once, and his physical peculiarity merely confirmed my suspicion. He was badly bitten during a saloon brawl in Adelaide in 89. Then, if Lady Frances is in their hands... It's possible she's already dead. They'll stop at nothing. But if she is still alive... Oh, she's undoubtedly being held in some sort of confinement, unable to get in touch with the outside world. Mm. Yes, my instinct tells me she's in London, but where? Oh, heaven alone knows. I've consulted our old friend Lestrade at Scotland Yard. Tomorrow we'll pay a call upon him to ask what he's discovered during our absence. So far, Mr. Holmes, I'm sorry to say we've drawn a blank. Uh, you disappoint me, Inspector. Well, you didn't give us a lot to go on, did you? Amongst all the millions in London, a search for those three individuals is worse than needles in haystacks. What about Lady Frances's jewellery? That could be traced, perhaps. Well done, Watson. I took the precaution of making a list of the jewellery with the help of Miss Dobney, and the inspector has been circulating their description through the usual channels, but thank you for the suggestion. Don't mention it. So that didn't produce any result, either. Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly. There was a report of one of the items turning up. Well, why didn't you say so? What was it? Where? A silver and diamond pendant of antique Spanish design was pawned somewhere in South London by a large, clean-shaven man of clerical appearance. Ah. Well, did it even name an address? Yes, but on investigation they turned out to be false. Did the pawnbroker notice the man's left ear by any chance? Well, I couldn't tell you offhand. I could look up the file if you're interested. Mm, you've set a plain-clothes man to watch the shop in case he tries it again. Oh, no, Mr Holmes. We can't do that. There's not enough evidence to justify wasting a man's time in that way. <sighs> Anyhow, I'll just fetch that file. I'll keep you a moment. <sighs> he should have kept the place under observation. <laughs> I presume it's against police regulations. Yeah, it's got a founded red tail. However, this will be a job for the Honourable Philip. It'll give him something to do. I'll send a letter to the pawnbroker, and they can fix him up in the back of the shop. Oh, I don't suppose Lestrade would approve of that. Mm -hmm. Lestrade isn't going to find out. Ah, Inspector, you're very quick. We don't hang about here in the yard, Mr Holmes. Uh, unfortunately, there's no mention of the gentleman's left ear in the description as given here. Oh, no, it must have been, Peters. I've no doubt on that score. Uh, by the way, as a matter of interest, where was this pawnbroker's shop? Uh, Bevington's, in Westminster Road, Brixton. But like I said, I can't take any further action as to that, I'm sorry. Oh, well, we must try to possess our souls in patience, mustn't we? You don't think Philip Green might go off the deep end again and resort to fisticuffs? Yeah, I put him on his honour. No violence, no indiscretion. He's promised not to take any action whatever without my knowledge and consent. Uh, let's hope he keeps his word. But time's running out, Holmes. And while we do nothing, some terrible disaster may befall Lady Francis. I am aware of that. We must be prepared for the worst. Listen, someone on the stairs. We have him. We have him at last. My dear sir, sit down. Try to calm yourself. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's just... I, I couldn't wait to tell you. Yeah, quite so. What has happened? She came to the pawnbrokers about an hour ago. Lady Francis? No, no. The man's wife this time. But the pendant she brought in was an exact match of the last one. She's a tall woman with pale eyes, like a ferret. That is the lady. I watched her from the back room, and when she left the shop, I followed her. She walked up Westminster Road, and I kept behind her. Presently, she went into a shop. Mr. Holmes, it, it was an undertaker's. Very well. Go on. I followed her in. She was talking to the man behind the counter. It's late, she said, or something like that. The undertaker was excusing himself. It should have been there by now, only it took longer being out of the ordinary, he said. Then they broke off and stared at me. So and I said something stupid about losing my way and left. Uh, you did very well. What happened next? When the woman came out, I was hiding in the doorway. I'm afraid her suspicions had been roused, for she looked about her, but she didn't see me and walked off. I followed her again from a safe distance till I saw her go into her house. Did you take a note of the address? Number 36, Pulteney Square, Brixton. I stayed where I was and watched the house for some time. The windows were all dark, 
except for one room on the ground floor. But the blind was down, so I couldn't see in. I was just wondering what to do when a van drove up with two men in it. They carried something out of the van, up the steps into the house. Did you see what it was? I did. God help me, it was a coffin. Good heavens. I was on the point of rushing in after them, but I remembered my promise to you, and uh, here I am. You've done excellent work. But we can do nothing legal without a warrant. Watson, yes. dash off a note to Lestrade, explaining the latest developments and asking him to apply immediately for a search warrant. But they could be murdering her at this very moment. Please try to control yourself, my friend. Now, while you take the letter to Scotland Yard, Dr. Watson and I will go at once to Pulteney Square. There's not a moment to be lost. Let us try to reconstruct the situation. Mm. The villains coaxed the unhappy lady to London mm -hmm. and made her their prisoner. They've already begun to sell her jewellery, which seems to them perfectly safe, as they've no reason to believe that anyone's concerned about her fate. But they must know that if she is released, she will denounce them. Precisely. Therefore, she must not be released. And as they cannot keep her under lock and key forever, they have but one solution. Murder. And yet, she is not to be disposed of in a hole in the back garden. They're preparing for a legal and official burial. Which means putting her to death in a way that would deceive a medical man. Hmm. Poison, perhaps. Hmm? But it seems strange that they should take the risk of calling in a doctor to sign a death certificate. Now, when... one moment, Watson. Stop the cab, oh. driver. Why are we stopping here? We've just passed Bevington's, the pawnbroker. This must be the undertaker's. Now, be so good as to go in and ask what time the Pulteney Square funeral takes place tomorrow. Oh, won't they think it rather odd? No, not a bit of it. Your appearance inspires confidence. Now, be as quick as you can. Well, what did they say? Eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, drive on to Portney Square. So, there's no mystery. Everything's to be above board. Yes, in some way. The legal procedures have been complied with. Yes, well, there's nothing for it but a direct frontal attack upon the fortress. Now, are you armed? Armed? No, I have my stick, that's all. Yes, well, let's hope we'll be strong enough. Thrice is he armed to have his quarrel just. Yes, and we certainly can't afford to wait for the police. We must take our chance, Watson. As we've done more than once in the past. Do you think this is wise? We have no choice. The warrant won't come through till tomorrow, and by then it'll be too late. Yes? What do you want? Good evening, madam. I'm sorry to disturb you at this hour, but it's a matter of some urgency after you, Doctor. Doctor? The doctor's already been. He signed the death certificate. Did he? Indeed. Nevertheless, we wish to speak to Mr Slessinger, sir. Uh, you've got the wrong house. Uh, take your foot out of the door. There's nobody by that name here. Well, in that case, we'll see the man who lives here. Unless Mr Peters is afraid to face us. Well, madam? My husband is not afraid to face any man in the world. You'd better come in. <laughs> What's going on here, Annie? These men forced their way in. That one calls himself a doctor. Uh, there's surely some mistake, gentlemen. I fancy you've been misdirected. Hey, perhaps if you were to try further down uh, the let's street... Let's not waste any more time. You are Henry Peters of Adelaide, also known as the Reverend Dr Slessinger, recently arrived from Baden. I'm as sure of that as that my name is Sherlock Holmes. Your name doesn't frighten me, Mr Holmes. When a man's conscience is easy, you can't rattle him. What's your business in this house? I want to know what you've done with a Lady Frances Carfax, whom you brought away with you from Baden. I'll be very glad if you can tell me where that lady may be. I have a bill against her for nearly a hundred pounds. Yes, and nothing to show for it but a couple of trumpery pendants that the dealer wouldn't hardly look at. She attached herself to Mrs Peters and me at Baden. Well, you are and... passing yourself off under an assumed name. Oh, I don't deny it, but that's no crime as far as I'm aware. The woman stuck herself onto us till we came to London. I paid her hotel bill and her travel tickets. Once we got here, she gave us the slip. And, as my wife says, she left us some old-fashioned jewellery to pay her bills. Now, if you find her, Mr Holmes, I'll be in your debt. Oh, I mean to find her. In fact, I'm going through this house until I do find her. Really? And do you have a warrant? I have a loaded revolver in my pocket. That will have to serve until something better comes along. <laughs> Is that so? It strikes me you're nothing but a common or garden burglar. <sighs> well, I might fit that description, certainly. And my companion is also a dangerous ruffian. Together, we propose to go through your house. Annie, fetch a policeman. Yes, Henry. <sighs> uh, don't you dare touch me. I wouldn't dream of it. 
If you try to stop us, Peters, you will certainly get hurt. Now then, where is the coffin which was brought into this house? What do you want with the coffin? You can't see it. It's in use. In other words, there's a body in it, and we wish to see that body. Never with my consent. Well, then, without it. Come, Watson, the front parlour. On the table. We need a light. Yeah, uh, this candle. Yes, that's better. Now, uh, lift the lid, Watson. <coughs> But this can't be... this aged, withered face. Oh, thank God, it's a different woman. Ah, so you admit you've blundered, Mr Holmes. Yes, you've blundered badly this time. Who is this woman? I don't know why I should tell you, but since you're so interested, she was Rose Spender, an old nurse of my wife's family. We found her at the Brixton workhouse and brought her here to end her life in peace and some comfort. She only lasted three days. Dr Housen of 13 Fairbank Villas, certified that her death was due to natural causes, senile decay. Would you agree with that opinion, Doctor? Upon superficial examination, yes. It seems quite probable. Uh, the funeral's to be carried out by Stimson and Company of Westminster Road, who will bury her at 8 o'clock in the morning. Anything wrong with that, Mr Holmes? I... I can't say. <laughs> I'm sure you can't. And I'd give a good deal to have a photograph of your staring silly faces when you pulled aside that lid, expecting to see Lady Frances and found a poor old woman of 90 instead. Yes, nevertheless, I must insist on going through this house. Oh, yes. Well, we'll see about that. Huh? Henry! This gentleman was waiting at the street corner. He's a policeman. Plain clothes, eh? Good. Do your duty, officer. These men have forced their way into my house, and we can't get rid of them. This is Mr Sherlock Holmes, and this oh, is... I already know Mr Holmes and Dr Watson. Well, trade, I thought I... I might find you. But you must know you've no business here without a warrant. Yes, I understand that. What are you waiting for? Arrest them. There'll be no necessity for that, sir. We know where to find Mr Holmes if he's wanted. Come along, gentlemen. Come, Holmes. We have to go. Yeah, sorry about that. But the law is the law. Oh, certainly, Inspector. You had to do your duty. I was on my way home when that chap arrived with your request for a search warrant. He told me where you'd gone, so I thought it might be best to take a hand in it myself before any uh, awkwardness took place. But we still feel certain the missing lady is in that house somewhere. Yes, Doctor, but the warrant won't be signed till the morning. In the meantime, I'll keep a man posted out here to make sure they don't try and smuggle her out. So you might as well take yourselves off to Baker Street and get a good night's sleep. Well, Holmes, did he manage to get any sleep? Uh, very little. To be so near and still fail. It's unbearable. Uh, and you managed to speak to that doctor, what was his name? Dr. Housen, yes. Yeah. He wasn't best pleased at being woken at such an unearthly hour, but he confirms the story Peters told us. The old woman was an inmate of Brixton Workhouse. Uh, whether she'd been Mrs. Peters' old nurse, I very much doubt. <laughs> and as to the cause of death... Dr. Housen was with her when she breathed her last, and he signed the certificate. He assured me that everything was perfectly normal. There was no question of any foul play. Uh, Nothing in the house struck him as suspicious in any way. Uh, perhaps not, but that was something suspicious all the same. I know it, I know it. Oh, well, if only I... Ah, good Lord! How could I have been so dim-witted? What time's the funeral? Eight o'clock. What time's it now? 7.20. Now, quick, man, hats mm -hmm. and coats. If we're too late, I shall never forgive myself. This is a race against time. What do you want? You can't come in here. Into the parlour, Watson. Don't you dare. The undertaker's busy in Put there. Put down that coffin, What gentlemen. the... You, do you have a warrant for this intrusion? The warrant's on its way, and the coffin remains in this house until it arrives. Are you the undertaker? I am, but I must protest. Never mind that. I see you have a screwdriver. There's a sovereign for you if that lid comes off within one minute. Well, let's help him, Watson. Come away, my dear. This is no place for us. This is an outrage, well, don't sir. Don't argue, man. Do as I say. What's happening here? Mr. Holmes. Come in, Lestrade, just in time. There. That's the last one. Lift your side. It's giving. Oh. <laughs> Chloroform, of course it would be. And the face covered with cotton wool. Yes, sir. Let me do that. There. Is that her? Is that Lady Francis Carfax? Yes. 
Is she alive, Watson? It depends how long she's been shut in there without oxygen. There may still be a spark of light within her. Stand aside, all of you. Pray God if I'm not too late. Mm. For some time, I was afraid we were too late. When her eyelids fluttered at last, it was something like a miracle. Yeah. And when Mr. Philip Green arrived... No, I felt sure he wouldn't be far away. I fancy he has a better right to take care of her than anyone else. Oh, yes, indeed. Mm. So the funeral was able to proceed. And the poor old woman who lay in the bottom of that coffin was allowed to go to her final rest alone. Yeah. Well, if you decide to add this strange case to your annals, let it be an awful warning. Mm -hmm. An example of the temporary eclipse to which even the best balanced mind may occasionally succumb. <laughs> what was it that put you on the right track, Holmes? Well, last night I, I lay awake, haunted by the thought that somewhere a clue had come to my notice and had been too easily dismissed. Yes, in the grey light of dawn, a few words came back to me. The words of the undertaker, as reported by Mr. Green. It took longer being out of the ordinary. Why was the coffin out of the ordinary? Then I remembered the deep sides and that little shrunken figure at the bottom. Why so large a casket for so small a body? To leave room for a second corpse, both to be buried under the one certificate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh... Damnably ingenious device. Mm. During the confusion, I gathered the precious pair managed to make their escape. No doubt they will soon be picked up. Mm. Let us hope so, indeed. <clears throat> Though, of course, if they should escape the clutches of the law, it might prove to be interesting. Interesting? Oh, yes, certainly. If our paths should cross a second time, the outcome might be very different. Yes. I await news of their future career with pleasurable anticipation. In The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams, with Jack Claff as the Honourable Philip Green. Inspector Lestrade was played by Stephen Thorne, Holy Peters by Peter Wickham, Mrs. Peters by Jilly Mears, Monsieur Moser by John Baddeley, Herr Brandt by Colin Pinney, Marie Devine by Rachel Atkins, and The Undertaker by William Maxwell. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax was dramatised for radio by Peter Ling and directed by Enid Williams.